tragic moment and the tragic period that he is going to face. Here's a man from a middle class extraction, as I was telling you before, who has reached the most powerful position in the land next to the monarch, becoming a Lord Chancellor. He has reached success practically in every field. In the social, the political, the professional, the personal, the economic, without compromising his self-respect. And we know very well that in any society, especially at that time, if you were a social climber, you had to do one very simple thing, and that is compromise yourself, compromise your integrity. Now he became, as I said before, he became chancellor without compromising. And this is an extremely difficult thing to do. It's almost impossible. Without compromising his own personal integrity. Again, his professional integrity, his strong sense of loyalty to friends, to his superiors, to his family, what really becomes uh, the cornerstone, uh, the basic fundamental, uh, the foundation of his, this man is his great understanding and awareness of his self. In other words, awareness and understanding of himself. Now, a lot of times, you know, we know what we like, but we don't know who we are. Okay? And uh, we don't know, or sometimes we are so hungry and thirsty for what we want, for our ambitions, that we forget who we are. But this is one thing that he never forgets, who he is. And this is how he maintains his self-respect, self-respect and his integrity. He would not and could not accept a compromise when it came to his soul or to himself. And this is the question, this is what brings him to lose his head, literally. Okay? Why? Because there was no compromise with him. This is the way it is. This is the way it has to be. And there is no, no middle way. Like all of us, you know, every day we find compromises for everything. But to him, there is no compromise. It's either one way or the other. And then, the question is not a religious problem, but of betraying the things in which you believe. So the, 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 the basic question is not a question of religion. It's not because he is Christian, okay? But because he truly believes in what he, in, in, in what he, the kind of man that he is. He believes in the law more than anything else, perhaps even more than religion. He believes in the rule of law. In other words, there are rules, there are regulations, there are strict laws. And the only way that a man can really survive himself and survive without compromising to corruption is the total respect of laws. And this is really, it's, it's this tragic point, not so much religion, okay? Because other people were Christian, they were Christian. But the problem is not religious. And then, that is the, the exactly in the, this, what distinguishes him from the common man, in other words, from all of us. One has uh, no problems, in other words, he has no issues, no problems about conforming to other, to other, other finds it, other people find it impossible. This impossibility to compromise leave him a lonely figure. Why? Because everybody compromises. And the problem is this. They, they, they go to him and they say, look, even his wife, Alice, she says, look, why can't you just simply say yes? And he gives her a very simple reason. He says, look, 
If I say yes, the day I find myself in front of God, are you going to come there and say to God why I said yes? I will be confronted to Him. I have to answer to Him for what I do. So I, I can't, there is no way I can compromise myself when eventually I have to go in front of God and be judged by God. Now all of you can, can do this, but this is exactly the point. They didn't understand why he could not say yes, the king is the head of the church. That's what they wanted him to say. No, you're a very wealthy man. You're, you know, the most powerful man in the country next to the king. Why can't you simply yay, say, yes, the king is the head of the church? I says, well, I can't. Because eventually, when I go in front of God, I have to justify what I say and what I do. And if I can't justify it, what are you going to do? You take my penance for me? You can't do that. I have to take it for myself. And this is basically the tragic moment when all of us, we are humans. In other words, we can, uh, we can sin, but he can't. He could, uh, he could have been simply, again, as I was saying, given public approval to Henry's marriage, but he didn't. He could have accepted the Anne Boleyn as the queen, but he couldn't. But that simple, a public approval, meant accepting everything. If he accepted that, the attack on the abbeys, the hall of uh, the Reformation, to which Thomas was opposed, all of what, what was happening, the Lutheran Reformation, you now. The other thing is that when, when, <laughs> when, king, when the king became the head of the church, he also became the owner of all the property of the church in England. And the church was very rich. Imagine all of the abbeys, the churches, they all became property of the monarch. All of this, he just could not accept. This is the reason, again, why he fell. He was a Catholic. Another important element. He was a Catholic. An oath. Now, an oath. Do you know what an oath is? Huh? Juramento. You take an oath. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. You're taking an oath. Okay? And to him, those, <laughs> this, was a, this was sacred. Okay? Uh, he was Catholic. An oath to such a man is not a light-minded action. In other words, it's not something that you take lightly when you take an oath. Now, a lot of people, um, you know, when one takes an oath, uh, you ask God, well, you know, a lot of times you watch TV and you watch, you know, those trials on TV and you see people taking a note and says, oh yes, I swear to tell the truth and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And what do they do? They lie. Okay? But what happens when, if you are a real Christian and you take an oath, what do you do? You are asking God to be your witness. And this is exactly what he considered. To him, taking an oath, taking an oath, was asking God to be his witness. How can you take an oath, ask God to be your witness, and then what do you do? You lie? To him, this was unacceptable. And the consequences, the consequences of this, the consequences of taking an oath and lying is perjury. 
and perjury, perjury, perjury is uh, when you tell a lie. In other words, you don't tell the truth. Okay? Perjury is eternal damnation. And he just not, could not accept this. To Thomas, the eventuality of eternal damnation was a real threat. In other words, now a lot of times when we take an oath and you lie, well, you know, I, I'm not going to go to hell. Okay? You don't believe it. All of us, we, we, you know, how many believe that you really are going to go to hell? Nobody. This is the point. To him, hell was real. <laughs> to him, uh, uh, damnation was a real thing. Now, but you say, you know, he was an extremely clever man, a very, very intelligent man, a scholar. A learned man, and yet he believed in the reality of damnation and the reality of hell. Yes, he did. He believed it. Now, you're all educated people. Honestly, look at yourself. How many of you really believe in hell? Nobody. Okay? Nobody. Right? The question is that if you don't believe in hell, you don't believe even in heaven. And if you don't have a strict rule, when you take an oath, when you take an oath, it's senseless. It doesn't mean anything. Because you take an oath and you take an oath the way you want. And you can change it, you can modify it. And you say, well, you know, I, I, I really didn't mean to. An oath is an oath. And to him, an oath was real. This is the tragedy, again, the difference between the common man, which is all of us, and him. And this is the tragedy of this man. A man takes an oath when he wants to comment himself. He wants to commit himself to something. To a statement or to something in which he truly believes. He offers himself as a guarantee of the pledge. A pledge is a promise. A guarantee of this pledge. What he, look, what he holds to be his most important asset in life is his own God who represents eternal life. Because the witness, because God is a witness of that pledge. È un testimone di quella, di quella promessa. Nowadays we hear, as I was saying before, promises everywhere, you know. People promise here, people promise in court, uh, they promise you the world. The day after, they forget about the promises that they made you. Okay? This, this is basically the problem. But he wants to keep that promise. He is a man of his word. And he maintains the promise. He keeps that promise because he he made that promise in front of God in something that he truly and really believes in. This is basically the problem. This is basically the tragedy. A real man in a world of non-men. So, but remember that the man we have here today, the man we're trying to explain to you, he, he's not an ascetic, in other words. He, he's not a hermit. He, he loves to live. He, he enjoys his social life. He enjoys his wealth. He loves his family. He is loved by his family. He's glad to be rich. Okay? He enjoys his position. He likes his position. He doesn't want to lose it. Okay? He, again, he's not a hermit. 
who is secluded in the desert. He is not an ascetic who meditates 24 hours a day. He is an everyday man. The difference is between him and all of us that he truly believes in something. He truly believes in rules and regulations, in the law, in God. And when he promises something, he will keep that promise, contrary to all of us. We make promises. Everybody makes promises we never keep. We witness. Everybody is our witness. But, you know, the day after we betray that loyalty, we betray that witness. And remember, he's a man from a simple middle class extraction. He's not wealthy. He, he is now, but he wasn't. You see? Who is, has acquired wealth and social position? One whose great properties for himself and has his family. One who has uh, entertained friends, nobles, and monarchs. The king goes, goes to his house quite a few times, and he entertains not only him, but also all of the people, all of his entourage when they go to his home in Chelsea. And imagine, imagine the cost of entertaining the king and the court for dinner. Not only once, but many times. So he enjoys this. So it's not a question, as I said, he's not a hermit, he's not a, an ascetic. Okay? And how could this, how could he then accept to leave all of this? Okay? So it's, it's not easy for anybody to say, okay, that's it, you know? If you're a hermit, if you're an ascetic, you're a monk. for me, it's no problem leaving the world. Okay? Why? Because I'm going to heaven. You know? The question is, he enjoys life. Why should he accept to be headed, to be beheaded? Okay? Enjoying life. Just because he didn't want to swear on an old black book and tell a lie. He didn't want to tell a lie, he didn't want to swear. You know, the other day, if you were watching television, somebody, one of, one of our politicians was swearing on the gospel. <laughs> Do you see what I mean about compromising? He was swearing on the gospel. swear just simply on an old book. And so Moore's answers to this question is perfectly simple, okay? His answer to the question, why can't you tell a lie? Because I can't. I cannot compromise my soul. I cannot compromise my selfhood. In other words, what I represent, who I am. Because the moment, the moment I do it, the moment I compromise, I am not the same man. And I want to be this man. I am this man. I don't want to change. I don't want to be anybody else. The English kingdom, the monarch, and the extended society at that time, were subservient to the Church of Christ, founded by Christ, entrusted in the hands of his Apostle Peter, and he and his successors. To some it has become a simple metaphor, but to others it still is, or even today, a reality. Today it is still a reality to some, but to most it is not. 
but it's still reality. The Pope, the vicar of Jesus Christ, is still the descendant, the successor of the apostles. Some people truly believe in that. And it's okay, take my hat off to the people who believe it. Moore's trust in the law was his great trust in society. In other words, what do I mean by this? As I was telling you before, one of his great trust was in uh, the law itself. Why? Because if you trust in the law, you trust society. Because the law is made up of rules and regulations, society is made of rules and regulations. And if you respect the rules and the regulations, you're respecting society. You're respecting the people who live in that society. And he had a, he had a, a great respect for, an enormous respect for laws, consequently for society as well. In 1532, Thomas resigned the chancellorship and lived in relative poverty. Now, he was a rich man, but obviously the moment he resigned the chancellery, he became, he, all of the income that he had before, uh, obviously he didn't have any more, but he had a lot of property. He had bought a lot of property. When I say to you a lot of property, I mean a lot of property for himself and for all of his family, all of his children. But he was too great a figure to ignore nationally and uh, around Europe as well. In other words, he represented socially, politically, historically, scholarly. He was an enormous figure. And the fact that he could not accept Henry as the head of the church, okay, uh, this could not be allowed. It could not be permitted in England. The king did not allow it. So the solution was very simple. Thomas had to, sub to submit to the Act of Supremacy. The Act of Supremacy was uh, stated and stated that everybody had to take an oath declaring that Henry was the head of the church in England. This is the only thing that Thomas could not accept. He could not, he accepted anything. He says, well, okay, the king says he is the head of the church, no problem, okay? If he says so, he's the head of the church, okay? The important thing is that don't ask me to say yes. But this is exactly what the king asked him to do. The king asked them to agree and take an oath to the act of supremacy, something he could not do. Then, at the end, he was found, obviously, he was on trial. He was judged by the chancellor who took him to court. And there was a trial. And uh, the Solicitor General, the Solicitor General, took an oath and lied, lied under oath, saying that Thomas had taken a bribe. Bribe, not said that. Okay? That Thomas had taken a bribe. He lied, obviously. And on the basis of this, okay, for corruption, he was sentenced. Okay? And obviously put in jail and beheaded for corruption in this sense, in this, for this reason. To the last moment he kept his wit. Now he's, he's a, an extremely witty person, extremely clever person. His wit and his dignity as a man. With his death, the king, Henry, lost 
a great administrator. Okay? Because he was the kind of administrator who did not accept corruption. And at that time, as it is today, everybody is corrupt. Everybody has a price. Okay? Even though you don't believe it. But this happens everywhere. And corruption at that time in England was very, very high on the list. So, first, Henry lost an extremely, an excellent administrator, and the church acquired a martyr and a saint. And this, this is the end. When he resigned, he was, he was relieved. He says, oh, good, now I've resigned. I don't have the responsibility anymore, okay? And uh, I finished. And strangely enough, you know, he, he also, by the way, he also had a fool. You know what a fool is? Huh? Uh, no, a fool. Uh, the Joker. What do you call it? The uh, Buffon. He had his own fool. Okay? After he resigned, the fool said, Chancellor Moore is Chancellor no more. Okay? <laughs> and then he, he himself, okay, because he knew eventually how things were going to go, his epitaph simply read the epitaph on his tomb, Thomas More, a Londoner born of no noble family. And then after that he listed all the things that he had done from studying at Oxford, uh, writer, a philosopher, a chancellor, and everything else. Now, I hope this, this is only a, an introduction to Thomas More. If you have time, go and read a little bit about Thomas More, uh, because he's a, really, he's a, the kind of person and the figure, the hero, uh, the humanist hero, who really deserves to be, to, to be studied, to be known and to know him is uh, a little bit to know yourself, you know? This is exactly what happens, that uh, slowly you, you begin to understand yourself a little more as well, you know? So it's, it's interesting to find out about him. I think we're finished.